would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. got a couple interesting tidbits today, folks. Uh, Before we jump into that, though, let me remind everyone how to reach out. The best way to get in touch with me is through the website at therebelbroker.com. From there, you can click on contacts in the menu bar and send along any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. You can also join the Rebel Underground. There is a link in the show notes of today's show and just about every other show. But if you prefer the more uh, squeaky clean, easy peasy way to do it, you can simply text the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222. That's text the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222. Follow the directions that you get in response. They'll serve two purposes. They'll give you the instructions you need. But in addition to that, uh, it'll verify that you've connected with the, the person you think you have, right? It'll let you know that you've connected with the Rebel Broker. Finally... If you would like to get your hat into the ring for that $50 Amazon gift card that we've been giving out at the beginning of every month, simply uh, head on over to therebelbroker.com. Click on the big red button at the top of the page titled Take the Survey to Support the Show. Once you've filled that out, you are in and you've also helped out the show by participating. Um, Make sure you do use an email address that you use on a regular basis because if I send you an email to let you know that you won and I don't hear back within a couple of days, I'm going to move on to the next person who won. So I'd hate to I'd hate to do that and then have you three or four days later come along and say, hey, great, I won, and then have me have to tell you that no, you didn't because you didn't respond in time. Uh, so thanks to all those folks who have gone to the trouble of doing it. You you've been, you have no idea how much you're helping the show, help me reach my goals with the show and helping the show show grow. And congratulations, all those folks who've won uh, 50 bucks so far. And to, to, to date, I think we have somewhere between 500 and 600 bucks worth of uh, gifts already out. So there you go. All right. We've got a, an interesting one right off the top that I think is one of those pieces of data that at first may seem elusive in terms of figuring out, well, what's What's the payoff for us, right? What, what's the action item that comes from this? Now, this article comes to us from Housing Wire, it, they, where they discuss the number one new home market in the United States. Builders started more than 30,000 homes in the past year in this specific market. So why is that something we care about? Uh, as an investor, typically buying a brand new home doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but survey the areas where this is happening. Because if you look at it in the right way, you are potentially finding areas of great opportunity. So we'll we'll cover that. Now, the area is Dallas-Fort Worth. You know, why, why keep a lot of mystery, right? Uh, it's the number one market in the nation for new homes, according to a new report from Metro Study, and they are a provider of primary and secondary market information for housing. Uh, Dowsing area, Dallas area housing starts increased 3.4% from the first to the second quarter of 2017, the study showed. This makes a total of 31,049 new home starts within the past 12 months, ending in the second quarter. Housing starts jumped 14% from the second quarter of 2016 to the second quarter of 2017. Builders in the da- Dallas area closed uh, just shy of 30,000 homes over the past 12 months. And that's an increase of 15.2% from the annual closings for the second quarter of last year. Quote, the increase in second quarter closings reflects stronger sales during the first quarter than the end of 2016. However, many builders and communities have hit a price ceiling, according to Paige Shipp, director of Metro Studies, Dallas, Fort Worth Market Studies. She went on to say, with the median new home price in Dallas, Fort Worth at $320,000, New home buyers are stretched to the limit of what they can afford. So 
what are we what are we pointing to this for right uh, you know we, we try to one thing on this show is we try to educate ourselves on ways to figure out smart ways to invest well here's something we know that's happening Dallas Fort Worth is growing right uh, the the despite the fact they're doing all this building prices are still tending to go up so here's what I'm going to suggest you do if if you're someone interested in the Dallas Fort Worth market when I see data like this I try to think what's what's the corollary to it. And in this case, it would be not new homes, right? Now, we've already talked about nationally, on average, brand new homes are 25% more expensive than their uh, pre-owned cousins, right? The ones that have already had somebody living in it for some period of time. Now, if you're doing your math right, I think that potentially spells an interesting opportunity. So let me explain why that is. Now, of course, you can always do the old fallback of figuring out the long-term stuff, right? You buy a, a single-family residential home, uh, an existing home preferably, because you don't want to pay that premium for a new home. And if the math works, you could do that long-term hold and invest and rent and all that wonderful stuff. And that all still works. However, I think a more potentially lucrative step on this would be one of two things, right? You can either uh, buy land and develop it, buy land and build a home on it or whatever you want to do. Um, I'm not sure that's where, where you'd want to go right off the bat. But I think if you can go into a market like this and find an existing home and do a flip, so you'd want to look for something that is absolutely in horrible shape. Because so much of the market is gravitating, dra- gravitating towards new homes, I think the potential upside on fully remodeled flips is being is going to be boosted by this percentage difference that you tend to see between existing homes and new construction. Um, Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is I'm coming from a mindset where the costs associated with building are ridiculously high. My understanding is that the costs involved, the overhead costs in the Dallas-Fort Worth area are not like what I'm used to. So it may not be 25%, but if it's more than the usual, in the old school terms, usual 6 to 7% above the, the typical market in that area for an existing home, if, in other words, if it's six percent more expensive than an existing home for for a, a new home of this of similar features, then that could spell an interesting avenue of approach for you as an investor, where you could turn that around and not only be providing something folks really need, but then being able to leverage off of the fact that you have all this new construction that's really sort of boosting the prices that folks are expecting to pay. Um, let's see, resale home prices continue to increase. New home prices are stagnant as compared to 2016. In an effort to spur sales, some some builders are either reducing prices or minimizing price increases, all while costs, including land, labor, and materials, march higher. Um, So I I think despite that, you'd still want to do the math. Uh, If if we're still seeing this percentage difference, um, I, I think it still potentially spells an opportunity. And here's one more reason why I think that's true. One other piece of data here is that um, the study showed that housing starts are down for homes under $200,000. Higher home prices, uh, priced homes increased. So you're seeing another one of these scenarios where there is a band of need on the part of consumers that isn't being met by what's being done out there. And I think that spells an interesting opportunity for rehabbers or flippers who can identify markets like this and meet that demand. Because at least one thing you're going to be guaranteed of when that thing's ready to sell, you're going to sell it in a heartbeat. Um, but I think that the one inherent problem, and this is one reason why I shy away from potentially suggesting this as your first foray into flipping or, or renovating a home before selling it, is I think that in order for this to work, you're probably going to have to be going for homes that are uh, facing a lot more challenges than a typical home. Uh, clearly, at these price points, there's a lot of attention. People are out there buying. So it's not like you're in a marketplace where you're going to be able to just, just sort of stroll in and grab whatever you want. You're going to need to go in and find properties that are challenged in such a way that they're tending not to sell with an understanding that you can't just do that anywhere, right? Whenever you're doing approaching a rehab, you don't want to buy an ugly home in a neighborhood of ugly homes, right? Um, 
typically you want to you want to be able to bring up a property to a standard for the neighborhood that that's higher than what that individual home represents right so you're it's the typical old mantra of you're looking for the worst home on the block um and trying to figure out a way to move that up but let me also warn you that you don't want to do a search like this in the area that's already a semi luxury or higher end neighborhood that really isn't going to work for you. Those are also going to be places that folks are really looking at because they're that's that's a ten, that's the end of the market that a lot of folks want to be drawn to. And so there's a lot more competition. And remember, the rules we want to live by when we're going out there to be an investor is be the smarter mouse in the maze, right? Don't follow every other mouse through the same route to the same piece of cheese. You've got to find those areas that tend to be ignored. So you're going to be looking for things that aren't in the best neighborhood, but then aren't in the worst neighborhood. You're going to look for something that kind of straddles that middle ground. And you're going to need to be particularly good at estimating what the cost will be to do the flip. Now, if you're a contractor, have contracting experience, or a contractor is already part of your team, great. You're probably going to do well. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that this not be your first run. I, I think this is a slightly more complicated scenario that's likely going to also require that you have a great team put together, not just from the standpoint of having a great contractor, but you're going to want to have a good real estate agent who can really give you the ins and outs of the markets and give you some definitions on or parameters at the very least on what areas make the most sense. And of course, the techniques that we have taught and the and the video that we shared with the Rebel Underground Cover still is a good source for you to figure out where these areas are in the greater Dallas Fort Worth area where this plan would work best. So don't think it can't be done. Don't think you absolutely have to be there. You can start the process doing it remotely. And eventually, you're going to want to go in there and get ground truth. I, I'm, I would never endorse the idea of buying a property site unseen. It would have to be extremely rare circumstances for that to make sense. And I just don't see that being something you could do, particularly on a rehab. But I think data like this, where we talk about areas that are seeing such growth in new home construction, um, and particularly because it's lopsided, right? It tends to be the more luxury end. I think this spells a window of opportunity for investors that shouldn't go ignored. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Now we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about some various real estate stuff. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We just spent a little bit of time discussing the number one market in terms of brand new home construction in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, I like that. I think in the long-term consideration of our marketplaces, that has to happen. Supply has to meet demand. But as I mentioned, it presents you with interesting windows of opportunity because the homes that are tending to be built are tending to be on the higher end in Dallas. So by going in there and finding properties that are well-suited to satisfying that more middling need, you can go ahead and have a situation where you're acquiring properties and being able to sell them in a in a, in a environment that's going to have a lot more uh, demand at a level that you're going to be able to sell that thing really quickly and probably be able to make a really good profit off of the improvements that you make. Now, just to sort of feed that beast a little bit more, we have another article that came out uh, from CNBC talking about home affordability. Now, Super interesting numbers are presented in this particular uh, news item. Homes priced under $200,000 made up 44% of the market in 2010. Now, granted, with the, with what we know about what was going on in 2010 versus what's going on today, I think that number actually makes a pretty good amount of sense. 
Uh, we were in the depths of the downturn, tons of foreclosures, lots of properties on the market. Boy, do I wish I had bought an awful lot of homes in my local marketplace. But when we take a look, the, the real payoff in this isn't just that flat number, right? Of course, seven years later, we're seeing what we're seeing. So that kind of makes sense. But what doesn't is when you look at household incomes, and that's what I think is really the more the more actionable thing here or the thing that should concern you more in terms of uh, household income growth versus uh, home price growth over the same period of time. Now, you can actually find graphs for that uh, on my Pinterest page if you want to check that out. And there's a link to the Pinterest page at therebelbroker.com, so you can check that out. I'll also include uh, kind of a really succinct chart in the show notes for today's show so that you can see the ratio, house price to income ratio, uh, and you can just see how much we, we've gotten kind of out of whack in terms of what people make versus what they're expected to pay uh, for housing. Uh, so you can take a few minutes out to check that out in the show notes. Now, finally today, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about migration patterns. We've talked about this before. We will often use uh, moving companies, things like that. But I think it's interesting to note where people are going to, where they're coming from. Um, and those relocation patterns can help you decide where you want to um to consider your options, right? Where, where people are leaving from and where they are going to, I think is important data for folks that are looking for potential investments. Now, what's interesting is uh, most of the major metros that we talk about, uh, ones that tend to get the most press, these are areas where people are leaving in the largest numbers. Um, my area, in terms of metros with the highest net outflow, and this, and by this, they're talking, they're 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 figuring this out based on the trends of people who are searching for properties. Now, the Bay Area, Mila area, ranked highest for net outflow for the second quarter in a row, which means the number of people in the Bay Area searching for homes in another metro was greater than the number of people in other metros searching for homes in the Bay Area. Uh, for prospective buyers, according to this report, in the Bay Area, the most frequent search destination was Sacramento. Uh, a location we talked about that was that we gauged would be booming by now, and it is. And it's another one of those ones where I had started the shopping process uh, to find a property and didn't, in my opinion, move fast enough. Um, that was part of my plan was selling my property was then to take some of that investment money and use it there. And obviously that got put on hold for a little while for reasons we've talked about on previous shows. Uh, the median sales price in Sacramento is 376000 in June. For comparison, the median sales price in San Francisco was $1.25 million. The top out-of-state destination was Seattle. New York and Los Angeles ranked second and third for largest net outflow for the second quarter in a row. Boston uh, took over Philadelphia as the most popular destination among people looking to leave New York. Uh, like San Francisco's, San Franciscans, Angelinos were also making intrastate moves. Of the people in Los Angeles looking, looking outside the area, more than a quarter searched in San Diego. Um, in terms of the 10 metros with the highest net outflow, I think this is pretty impressive stuff. So uh, San Franciscans down net outflow, 16,913. Uh, and the top destination was Sacramento in terms of locations within the state, and Seattle was the top outside of the state. New York was number two with down 15,790. The top destination was Boston, uh, and Boston was the same location for both out-of-state and top destination in general. Number three is Los Angeles with a net loss of over 13,000. San Diego was the top des destination with Las Vegas being the top out-of-state destination. That kind of surprises me. Um, I'd love to get the demographics on who those people are. Number four, uh, Washington, D.C. metro area down over five and a half thousand. The top destination and the top out-of-state destination of the same place, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Chicago was next with a uh, loss of 2,600 plus folks. Interestingly enough, they were heading for Los Angeles. Uh, that was their top out-of-state and top destination overall. In terms of uh, let's see where people, there's all kinds of folks going to Florida in terms of the 10 top 10 Metro areas, net 
inflow of users, all right? So these are areas that are seeing the largest number of folks coming to them. Now, I say these for, I'm mentioning these for a couple of reasons. If you own properties in the areas we were just talking about where things are are dipping in terms of net losses of people, that's some, that would be another one of those things we've talked about in the past that should kick off your interest in evaluating your investment. Try to get a good feeling for your local marketplace in terms of desirability, demand, how likely are you to be able to sustain it? Do you need to shift your strategy from being a buy and hold to being a flip or to just being time to liquidate the asset and move on to greener pastures in terms of your market? All right, so now that we've talked about that, let's talk about uh, the metros with the net, with net inflow. Uh, there's a few interesting ones here, some that aren't going to surprise us. We'll hit the top five. San Diego, California with 5,233 net inflow. Top origin people moving there were from Los Angeles and Seattle. Number two, Sacramento, net increase of just shy of 5,000. Uh, folks in Sacramento were coming from San Francisco and Seattle. So folks are moving from Seattle to San Diego and Sacramento uh, in the largest numbers. Number three, Phoenix, Arizona. And this is one we've talked about before. We've talked about the greater Phoenix area, the Phoenix metro. Uh, we talk about cities that don't ring a bell a lot and, and that are in Arizona. And nine times out of 10, those tend to be some of the smaller communities that hug right up against Phoenix. So I think Phoenix is an interesting marketplace. I, I'm not as jazzed about it. I've been to Phoenix quite a few times, so I'm familiar with the city. Uh, I'm not sure I would want to live there, but I like the area north of Phoenix. But I sure as heck wouldn't mind having a couple of investment properties in Phoenix because it's it's definitely, I think, got long legs. The folks moving to Phoenix were from Los Angeles. Uh, that's the top origin city and also the top out-of-state origin city. Number four on the list, and this one still kind of amazes me with over 3,600 net inflow, is Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, Los Angeles, again, the number one source. So a lot of these folks that are going to these other cities are coming from Los Angeles. It's kind of mind-blowing. Number five on our list, Atlanta, Georgia. And we've talked a lot about Atlanta in terms of uh, good investment opportunities. We've talked about return on investments in some areas of Atlanta. Uh, we've talked about a diverse economy that is good for more stability in the rental environment. They had just about a 3,000 uh, net win uh, with folks coming from New York uh, as the predominant source. As we go down this list, we can see some other areas that are familiar. We talked about Dallas earlier. Dallas came in at number six on this list. Uh, unfortunately for Texas, most of those folks are coming from Los Angeles. Tampa is number seven on the list. Miami is number eight on the list. Uh, nine is Boston. And 10 is Austin, Texas. So, and, and again, too bad for Texas, unfortunately, that the number one source of people coming to that city uh, is San Francisco in terms of the biggest numbers. Uh, so these are these are all interesting things, and that Austin thing also feeds my estimate from what three years ago now that Round Rock would be a big boomer, and that actually ended up that estimate came true immediately, right? I I called Round Rock as the number one investment location for the following year. Sure enough, it in the reports we got towards the end of the following year, the greatest return on investment was coming from Round Rock. Uh, I think there are still plenty of opportunities. Here's what's great about areas like Austin and Dallas. Even if you're not a fan, right? Even if you're not a fan of the heat and you're not a fan of Texas in general, one thing that is good about these areas is uh, there tends to be an awful lot of room to grow around them. So you'll find communities cropping up. And I think what you find is that you get a little bit less volatility in these markets. So I think that opportunities still present themselves there. Whereas in my marketplace, getting something built is is almost a, a impossible task. There are so many things put in your way to, to make it hard that a lot of folks simply go to other places where, where folks are demanding housing and just do their work there instead of fussing with California. But it makes it difficult to ignore a market like mine where we have cities where the average cost or average price to acquire a home is a million bucks. Knowing you could get a million dollar payoff for every single home you build makes it very attractive for some builders despite all of the of the obstacles that are put in their way. Um, but in any event, I hope that these are good fuel for you to consider new opportunities, whether it's you thinking about an investment you already have in one of the cities where populations are declining or there's more outflow of folks uh, and potentially putting that somewhere else, or you're trying to make that first step and decide where there's the demand, where are people tending to go? Now, what's interesting about Las Vegas, uh, one reason why Las Vegas stands out to me is 
It wasn't that long ago we were talking about problems in Las Vegas with a softening in the market in Las Vegas, property staying on the market for a little while. So we may be at a pivot point in Las Vegas where that market might represent a good investment for you. Uh, although we did also talk with um, a guest two weeks ago who is uh, based in uh, Tennessee who's going to be doing investing in luxury uh tenant style, not tenant, but luxury vacation style housing in Las Vegas. So there may be an uptick here in Las Vegas because of the migration from Los Angeles in the single family residential zone. Because you know what? All the investors I've talked to that are doing things in Las Vegas, that's the kind of things they're doing. They are not doing single family residential long-term rentals. So maybe it's worth your time to check that one out. All right, folks. I hope we've managed to make this a valuable use of your time. That's always the goal, to give you a little bit more than you invest, just like you should be getting out of your real estate. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you all next time.